Part 27 The Struggles of the First Muslims Abdullah ibn Masud mentioned that the first group of seven that embraced Islam were himself, Abu Bakr, Amar, Sumaya, Suhaib, Bilal, and al Mikdad. He continued, As for the Prophet, Allah protected him through his uncle. As for Abu Bakr, Allah protected him through his own tribe, the Banu Quaffa. And as for the remainder, then the Quraysh rounded them up and began torturing them. They would take burning iron and place it on their bodies until they complied. Every one of them gave up and said out of duress whatever the Quraysh wanted them to say, except for Bilal ibn Rabbah. He did not consider his soul worth anything in front of Allah. That is, he was willing to give up his soul, and he refused to budge in the slightest. As a result, they concentrated all their efforts in torturing him. I saw Bilal handed over to the thugs of Mecca who proceeded to tie a rope around his neck and drag him across the streets of Mecca. All the while he shouted, Ahad! Ahad! One! One! Proclaiming the oneness of Allah. 187. Bilal's master was one of the worst culprits of the Quraysh, Umayya ibn Halaf, who participated in his torture. It is worth noting that slaves were expensive to acquire and own. It was therefore counterintuitive to harm one's own slave, further demonstrating the extent of their animosity to Islam and Muslims. Umayya would personally take Bilal into the desert and place a massive rock on his chest and leave him in the sun for the entirety of the day. Hassan ibn Thabit once recalled that when he performed Hajj from Medina, he noticed how badly Bilal was being punished, wondering how he remained alive. Ammor ibn Alas similarly recalled that the rocks placed on Bilal were so hot that meat could be cooked on them. Amr continued, I heard Bilal repeatedly say, I reject Allah and al Uzza, and I believe in Allah. Many years later, Urwa ibn Zubair, the nephew of the mother of the believers Aisha, narrated, Bilal was tortured by the people of Mecca, and by Umayya ibn Halaf in particular, but he never gave them a single word to please them. Bilal's honor and reward matched his struggles, as the Prophet eventually appointed him as the Mu'addin, caller to prayer, of the Ummah. The same voice that roared, One! One! would echo throughout the city of Mecca five times a day calling the Muslims to prayer. Bilal's reputation and prestige withstood 1,400 years of Islamic history, as he is still most known for his bravery, forbearance, and unwavering belief in Allah. The Quran states, Is there any reward for goodness except goodness? Surah 55, verse 60. The Prophet said, Give the azan even if you are alone, because no jinn or human will hear your voice, except that they will testify to what you said on the Day of Judgment. Bilal, having the honor of being the Prophet's Mu'addin, will therefore have the Prophet's testimony in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. Habab ibn Alarat was of the first ten people to embrace Islam. He was an Arab slave of Yemeni origin and had a female master, Umm Anmar. When she found out that he embraced Islam, she hired a mob to beat him so badly that he lost consciousness, waking up in a pool of his own blood. She would even partake in his torture, holding a piece of burning iron against his back. The Prophet was pained by Habab's state, so he made a heartfelt dua to Allah, O oh Allah, please help Habab against his enemy. A few days later, Umm Anmar woke up in a rabid state of psychosis. The doctors of Mecca prescribed her with a treatment of cauterization which led to her death. The Prophet once commanded, No one may punish with fire except the Lord of fire. Allah then decreed poetic justice that her demise was via a painful bout of cauterization. Many years later, when Umar ibn al-Hattab was caliph, he asked Habab about Umm Anmar. Without saying a word, Habab simply lifted his shirt and exposed his back. Umar exclaimed, By Allah, I have not seen anything like this before. He then placed Habab on the seat beside him as a show of honor. When Abu Bakr was caliph, he ruled that all government representatives received the same salary. However, when Umar took charge, he ruled that the earliest converts received the highest salaries. Habab therefore received a very generous salary as one of the earliest to embrace Islam. He built a modest house in Kufa and used the remainder of the money to create a charitable trust in the form of a treasure box in his house. 
The box was unlocked and open for anybody to take whatever they wanted without needing to request permission. On his deathbed, he began to cry. The people around him said, Why are you crying? You have suffered so much to reach the highest level and meet the prophet. He replied, I am not crying out of pain or fear of meeting Allah. I am crying because of what you see around you, that is, the house. How will I answer Allah about this luxury? Indeed, I was with a group of people who were all tortured on equal footing, but every one of them has departed without tasting the sweetness of this world. And Allah has left me to enjoy the fruits of this world. I am scared that because I have enjoyed the fruits of this world, my share of the hereafter will be less than that of my companions. As they prepared his kafan, cloth for shrouding, he began to cry once more and said, By Allah, I remember Hamza, the uncle of the prophet. He did not even have enough cloth for his own kafan, yet here I have this luxurious kafan in front of me. With what will I meet Allah? The stories of Yasir, Sumaya, and their son, Amar, have captured the hearts of Muslims for over a millennium due to their unified struggle in the face of unrelenting, merciless torture. They were tortured in front of each other, a fate far worse than the physical pain itself. Their torture was so severe that the Prophet made a special dua, Be patient, O family of Yasir, indeed your place is in paradise. Sumaya bravely rebuked Abu Jal despite her slave status, to which Abu Jal murdered her in the most brutal and inhumane manner. She thus became the first martyr in Islam. Yasir was then brutally killed, joining his beloved wife in the hereafter. Abu Jal then killed Muhammad, Amar's older brother, and turned to 15-year-old Amar, the youngest of them all. At this point, Amar could not bear the pain any longer and succumbed to Abu Jal's demands, outwardly renouncing his faith. Amar was so distraught about what he uttered that his worry about potentially committing disbelief was at the forefront of his mind, despite the horrific events that just occurred. He ran to the Prophet in despair and said, O Messenger of Allah, I have uttered words of kufr, disbelief. The Prophet asked, How do you find your faith in your heart? He replied, As it always was. That is, his faith is as strong as it always was, and his words did not depict what was in his heart. The Prophet reassured him that he had no blame, and he was permitted to repeat those words if they tortured him again. Allah then revealed Surah Al-Nahl. Whoever disbelieves in Allah after their belief, not those who are forced while their hearts are firm in faith, but those who embrace disbelief wholeheartedly, they will be condemned by Allah and suffer a tremendous punishment. Surah 16, verse 106. The Prophet said about Amar, his iman has been filled in his heart all the way to his neck. That is, his faith is overflowing. And, whenever the son of Sumaya is faced with two options, he always chooses the most correct of the two. Suhaib al-Rumi, the Roman, was not actually Roman. He was of Iraqi descent but was captured by a Byzantine force as a child and was enslaved in Rome. He escaped, recalling his Arab heritage, and fled to Arabia. Eventually, he was bought by Abdullah ibn Judan in Mecca. While ibn Judan did not torture him, he did not prevent the likes of Abu Jal from doing so. However, compared to the likes of Abu Jal and his ilk, ibn Judan was more lenient as a master. He granted Suhaib responsibilities in trade and granted him freedom in his will. Upon ibn Judan's death, Suhaib emigrated to Medina, but was stopped by the Quraysh on the outskirts. Suhaib took out his bow and arrow, saying, You know I am the most accurate shooter, and I promise that none of you will be able to touch me until every arrow in my quiver will touch human flesh. And I promise that none of you will be able to touch me until my sword is bent and broken upon your bones and blood. They did not approach any further, but demanded that he leave his money behind if he wanted to continue his journey. Not only did they demand his wealth, but they insisted that he leave his horse behind and continue on foot. Suhaib was faced with a choice, turn back with his wealth or continue to the Prophet, penniless and on foot. Suhaib thus became the only companion ever to perform hijra on foot, leaving with nothing but the clothes on his back. He reached the Prophet in Masjid Kuba disheveled, dehydrated, malnourished and crawling on his hands and knees. The Prophet personally received him and wiped the dust off him.
He smiled and repeated three times. Your trade was profitable, O Suhaib. Astonished, Suhaib replied, No one could have told you about that, O Messenger of Allah, except Jibreel. Allah then revealed a beautiful verse regarding Suhaib al-Rumi. And there are those who would sell themselves for Allah's pleasure, and Allah is ever gracious to his servants. Surah 2, verse 207. Once, the leaders of the Quraysh were conversing with the Prophet in a promising manner. Abu Jahl intervened, pointing to Suhaib, Bilal, and Amar, saying, We cannot accept being the subordinates of such people, so expel them. Allah then revealed, Do not dismiss those poor believers who invoke their Lord morning and evening, seeking his pleasure. You are not accountable for them whatsoever, nor are they accountable for you, so do not dismiss them, or you will be one of the wrongdoers. Surah 6, verse 52. Allah honored them so much that he instructed the Prophet himself that leaving them would be ruinous.